So I'm Andrew Kudnick. I am a graduate researcher at USF Morshani College of Medicine. I am studying uh, cancer cachexia, uh, which is involves kind of three interests of mine. Uh, one being cancer, which is a very stimulating topic. Uh, never really gets old looking into cancer and it, how it's, it's multifaceted nature and the different types. Then you also have a body recomposition uh, that's a consequence cancer, which happens in some patients and some tumor types. And that's a particular interest to me in my background in exercise physiology and um, looking at that just from an exercise nutritional perspective, but now looking at it from a disease perspective. And then uh, the third component to that is looking at nutritional or lifestyle interventions. Um, in my project, more so nutritional met metabolite uh, interventions to see if those have any influence, positive or negative, on uh, this disease state. So the question is, what is cancer cachexia? Right. All right, so if I were to describe you know, cancer cachexia, I guess you should first understand that there's gotta be cancer present for there to be cancer cachexia. Cachexia can be associated with a few, a few different disease states, including COPD, um, AIDS slash HIV, um, chronic kidney disease, these can all kind of uh, facilitate what is generally termed or uh, cachexia, which is a, a wasting syndrome, uh, a disease-induced wasting. And in cancer specifically, there seems to be, um, it's, it seems to be very multifaceted and heterogeneous how it manifests in patients, but uh, there seems to be an appearance, uh, obviously you have the tumor that's first pre present. Uh, if you don't have the tumor or a cancer in general, you're, you're not going to have this syndrome. Um, but when it's described in the literature, there's been a lot of definitions over the years, all the way back to 1921. There was a paper that um, looked at the incidence of cachexia in, in, or the incidences of death in cancer patients. And what they found was that cachexia seemed one of the, the most uh, prevalent uh, causes of it. Is around, they estimated at 23%, although they felt they underestimated that number. Um, they found it to be around 20%. And that number's kind of stayed up till today, about 80 years later um, plus since that, that paper came out. And over time, the definition has become more complex. It, it, at one point, it was anemia, wasting, and fatigue in that paper uh, in Warren, I believe it was 1921 or 23. And over time, it's kind of evolved. There was a paper in 2008 that had defined it as a multifactorial syndrome involving uh, Inflammation being a primary one. So that's uh, one of the big things is, is first you have to have the wasting. So what is the wasting? You're, you, you know, you might have a manifestation of body weight loss, but really the, the primary interest in cachexia is skeletal muscle wasting. Uh, then you also probably have committant or, or concurrent uh, adipose tissue wasting, so it's just wasting of important tissues within the body. Uh, not, not healthy weight loss, we're talking about pathological weight loss or disease-induced weight loss. And that's also accompanied by often in this disease state with inflammation, and that is often attributed to pro-inflammatory cytokines, or at least that's of particular interest in this field, is pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1-beta. Um, those are a few of the uh, interesting parts. and. In, Inflammation, we can get into how that may arise, but that's a, of key interest. You also have metabolic changes that can occur. Some people attribute that to the inflammation. Um, and, and then on top of that, you also have things such as anemia or hypoalbuminemia and a few other uh, facets to the condition that make it very complex. And they describe it as a multifactorial syndrome uh, that up to about, I think, over 100 clinical trials have occurred thus far. And there is no standard of care for the condition yet. And um, that's likely due to a few reasons. Well, one of the main ones being that most of the current treatments are monotherapies addressing one facet of the condition. And it being a very complex multifactorial syndrome that is often, uh, a monotherapy might not be sufficient. And we also see that what appears to be the case in cancer as well. Um, not always the case, but a lot, a lot of times the cancer is very complex. And a monotherapy that's very targeted may not um, be effective enough um, so that, that in general describes uh, cancer cachexia. But that's kind of evolved into, I guess, a paper that came out by Argyles in 2013 that really, I think, refined the definition into what I think is the most accurate way of describing it because War, uh, Evans in 2008 described it as, as very complex with many, many committant problems. But I think that 
you know, having delved deeper into this and looking at it, I feel like the 2000, I think it's 13 or 14 paper by Argyle's a Nature Review paper on cancer, um, described it as a condition that involves wasting of uh, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue with inflammation being the two most important aspects to the con disease. Because of those two aspects to the disease, you have these other aspects of the condition that arise, such as anemia, fatigue, um, that ultimately has impacts on prognosis and patient outcomes. And, and many times not talked about, but is extremely important is quality of life of the patient. And I think that definition really describes it best um, because those do seem to be the most primarily um, cited aspects of the condition. And then you have these other things that come along with it that do contribute to the disease in its complexity but um, those seem to be uh, the priority in many ways. And so we're, when we are studying cancer cachexia, we're attempting to address the first two aspects, primarily in, um, using a uh, animal model that we believe could be efficacious for studying cancer cachexia. So we're, I guess, well, I guess we'll start with what, what have we done thus far on this project? Because our lab has looked at cancer and more so in metabolic therapies towards cancer. But when we undertook this project, I was looking into model systems and what may be the best or most appropriate model system to use. And I felt that there was, and this was going on four or three years ago, and I felt that there was a lot of gaps. And there always are, you know, there's always caveats with models where you're using a rodent and, and hoping that whatever you're assessing there or finding there, or whatever treatment you may be giving to test its efficacy, will it translate? And that obviously is, uh, extreme interest in having a very good model system to not only understand the disease, but maybe understand the efficacy of the treatment is really important. When we're, you ask the question, you know, how do you even begin to study this? You know, obviously as, coming in as a graduate student, that's the first thing you try to understand is how do you appropriately study uh, whatever disease you're trying to study? And in this case, it's cancer cachexia. Um, and for many uh, many graduates and other labs or whatever, you know, this is like kind of the first thing you try and get at is how are we gonna study this? And, you know, with such a complex, multifaceted disease as cancer cachexia, it's hard to find a model system that encompasses all facets of the condition. And that was something that I, I guess, personally was very interested in when I first came into this because no model system obviously replicates all facets of the condition. I, I guess it's not maybe obvious, but it is if you understand how multifactorial it is um, when you have wasting of muscle, um, you have wasting of adipose tissue, you have inflammation, anemia, metabolic changes, low hormonal levels, um, low albumin levels, um, uh, with a host of other issues, that's a very complex scenario. And to expect that any model system may encompass all of that um, is a high order. And so I was very interested in that and to understand well, what, what's out there to study this condition, granted how people are describing that it's seen in patients. And there didn't seem to be necessarily a perfect model. So what was often talked about in the literature was, well, you know, no model is going to be perfect, but, you know, you can use a particular model to answer a question. And that's completely valid. So let's say you want to address just the wasting aspect of the skeletal muscle, not necessarily the inflammation. Well, you can choose a model that just has that independent of other factors and try and address that question in that way. But let's say you want to address the inflammation plus the muscle wasting. Okay, well, there's model systems of that. Um, where, you know, maybe a model where you inject this particular type of tumor into the animal, it induces inflammation, that inflammation has been shown to induce the wasting. Um, that would be a great model to assess inflammation induced muscle wasting. Let's say that, you know, you want a test of therapy uh, for efficacy against inflammation induced muscle wasting. But you're afraid that you might have a confounding influence of the cancer, the, the treatment on cancer. And so how do you piece that apart? Well, maybe you use an inflammatory-based model, like there's models like LPS, or maybe you inject, inject directly maybe the pro-inflammatory cytokines that you're interested in to induce you know, some uh, level of acute wasting with the animal. And then you can try and address that independent of other factors. Uh, so then you've got to ask the question, how, are you, how do you choose the best model system? What is the best model system? And I think that all depends on the question you have. And I kind of talked about that a little bit before, but it depends on the question. Well, the question I wanted to address when I first came into this is, can a therapy have a positive impact on the cachexia phenotype 
in a model system that seems to encompass the multifactorial syndrome that is encompassing many, if not all, aspects of the condition. And there seem to be very few models that seem to get all of that together. Um, and so what I actually ended up doing for the first part of my PhD thus far was actually looking at trying to look at a new model system that um, involves metastatic disease spread and seeing if, because I felt that the metastatic process, at least in the literature, seemed to be an important aspect in some, in the more advanced stages of cachexia. When cachexia is most prevalent is in the advanced stages in the metastatic condition. So I felt like maybe there's something unique about the metastatic um, process that makes cachexia more prevalent. So I wanted to have a model system that at least had that happening. So we looked at a model system that did involve uh, the metastatic condition and, and found that now I won't say t to our surprise, but you never know what you're, you're looking for. You know, we try to address this question in a uh, multifaceted way, granted the multifaceted condition and, and address, okay, does it have muscle wasting? Does it have adipose tissue wasting? Does it have inflammation? Um, not just one biomarker, but across multiple biomarkers. And does it have other clinical biomarkers that patients may see when they come into the clinic with cachexia, such as anemia or, or hypoalbuminemia um, and, and whatnot. So we, we kind of address it in that multifaceted way. And we found is that the model system that we, we were evaluating did seem to have many, if not all the hallmarks we actually looked at. Um, and what we looked at was the metastatic process, which was present, muscle wasting, which was present and progressive, uh, adipose tissue per, uh, wasting, which was present and, and also progressive, inflammation, which again was present and progressive at multiple facets, at, or, at the organ level, at the white blood cell level, and at the cytokine level. And we also addressed other clinical biomarkers, looking at markers of anemia, like a hematocrit and hemoglobin. Um, and um, albu albumin, and all these moved in the direction of cachexia, indicating that this model seems to have all, not all, okay, but uh, all the ones we evaluated, uh, all the multifaceted aspects of the disease we saw. And so at this point, we're interested in evaluating therapies that may modulate what appears to be a multifaceted condition. And we are attempting to do that in a very, um, cancer dependent and independent way. Because when you study cancer cachexia, what you could almost expect is any treatment you give is gonna modulate the cancer. So cancer type is obviously of particular importance when evaluating efficacy for a cachexia treatment. So um, that has to be kept into account. So what we're attempting to do, um, or hy hypothetically what we're uh, going to be doing as we move forth is addressing mod the model system we evaluated um, for some of the things we're interested in testing as anti-cachexic um, uh, molecules, but also addressing that independent of the con huge confounding influence of the cancer itself. An ideal therapy for cachexia, at least in my opinion, would be something that not only negatively affects the tumor, so, or the cancer, um, you don't, we wanna give an uh, anti-cachexic agent that makes the tumor worse. That's the primary cause of cachexia even being there, so you would hope to first address that. And, so you'd wanna have something that hopefully has a negative effect on the, the cachexia, but you also want something that maybe addresses multiple facets of uh, the disease, or maybe it's a targeted therapy that you can combine with other agents that you know have specific effects and you combine them together to have um, a multifaceted treatment for a multifaceted condition. Um, so I guess it kind of gets to, well, what are we particularly interested in? Well, our lab is, we looked at metabolic therapies and things that influence metabolism, which is an important aspect of cancer, but also it seems to be a particularly important aspect of cachexia as well. So something that may have a powerful, powerful influence on modulating metabolism would probably have a very powerful influence on um, cachexia, whether good or bad. Um, so what we're interested in a lot of times are things like, uh, well, we're interested in the keto, we have studied a lot of, about the ketogenic diet, um, work prior to me joining the lab. But I'm particularly interested in the metabolites of um, the diet. What is the diet induced metabolites or fasting also induces these metabolites of, you know, you have beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate and the other one is acet acetone. Um, and I'm interested in these metabolites because a lot of times when you, you know, the diet's an interesting perspective for cancer. There's a lot of interesting data around that. Um, 
but I'm interested in, in cachexia, not necessarily, you know, the cancer component is an integral part of cachexia, but I'm interested in focusing on the cachexia aspect of the condition of what can these metabolites do independent, not independent of cancer, because that's also important to the cachexia condition, but more so the cachexia phenotype, what we can do to modulate that um, and, and find ways to evaluate that independent of the, the cancer being modulated also. And that, that creates a very difficult um, experimental uh, problem to try and address. And so it ultimately involves probably multiple model systems that allow us to isolate out factors and kind of get to the, the best answer as to what is or is not happening with these therapies. But I'm interested because in, in administering something that allows us to address the metabolite-induced effects specifically, because when you look at like the ketogenic diet, um, and there actually has been at least one or two papers in Cachexia looking at that, um, and or the metabolites themselves, which have shown some, some positive effects, which is interesting, because um, there's been a long-standing level of information regarding metabolite-induced changes at the skeletal muscle level metabolically. And so I'm, I'm extremely intrigued about the possibility that th if you were to administer these molecules independent of the diet, what would the influence of that be? Because when you have the diet, you have, you know, typically, if, like say, just a patient scenario. Um, if you were to go from a standard diet to uh, a ketogenic diet, you're probably going to lower your insulin levels. You're probably going to ha have effects on your blood glucose levels. Um, along with a, a host of other changes that we're now starting to understand better about the diet. But there seems to be unique aspects of the diet that are particularly induced, at least in part, through the metabolites themselves. So what happens if we were to administer metabolites independent of the whole diet? Um, because there's so much happening with the diet. Well, maybe we can get answers as to what the metabolites may be doing independent of some of these other factors. Now, I, I wouldn't say that the metabolites aren't going to have a multifactorial effect, the data seems to indicate that's certainly going to be the case. But it does allow us to isolate out the metabolites only, maybe not an entire dietary shift. Um, and that's some of what we're interested in, in exploring um, from a cachexia, but more specifically cancer cachexia therapy, now that we have what we feel is a, a model system that when used committantly with other model systems may help us address some of the questions involving therapeutic efficacy of some of these treatments.